Professor Ellen Dunham Jones, the director of the Urban Design Program uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, professor of architecture, who's going to present a very interesting topic here today uh, based on her best selling book in the US, Retrofitting Suburbia. And the talk is Retrofitting Suburbia for the 21st Century. And Ellen Dunham Jones, as, as I said, she's a director of urban design program at Georgia Tech, uh, one of the leading urbanists on a suburban development. Uh, and it's out, author of probably more than 60 articles in contemporary urban planning and urban design journals. And uh, as I said, an author of this very important book called Retrofitting Suburbia, Urban Design Solutions for Redesigning Suburbs, together with uh, your co-author, uh, June um, Williamson, right? Uh, you've been present in all kinds of media. The book has gotten a lot of attention, uh, not least from New York Times, uh, from uh, uh, all the architecture and urban planning magazines. You've also given a TED Talk. I don't know if your success is valued by a TED Talk. Apparent, I mean, it is. If you don't give a TED Talk, you're nobody. So just to everybody in the room, uh, you still have a chance, including myself. Uh, so, And it's a really good, one of the really good TED Talks on, on cities and suburbia. Uh, you've been teaching, I think, for many, many years, and also especially at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, guest, also guest scholar in other places. Uh, also, this book has received an award uh, from a number of uh, places, uh, been featured in the Harvard Business Review. And uh, uh, I know that the result of the book, or sort of the, the spin-off effect, is this huge database of suburban projects that you have, and maybe it's the only one in the U.S. Uh, so. I think maybe a number of lessons will be learned after uh, Ellen's talk today, how do we retrofit our suburbs? Because our suburbs are slightly different than they are, they are, well, uh, I'm not sure what kind of cure we can have for them. Maybe they don't have a disease, but they are sick a little bit or more. Uh, so we're really happy to have you. And um, my name is Tigran Haas. I'm the director of the Center for the Future Places and one coordinating this Athena series. So I, I really uh, hope you can join us for also other talks until the end of the year. But now, Ellen, I will give you the word and uh, you talk as long as you like. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I am just delighted to be here, to be back at KTH, back in Stockholm. And, uh, oops, so I'm going to switch. Where do I get? There we go. Um, to my things. So, and I'm really honored to be a part of the Athena lecture series. It's a fantastic, I think, lineup um, of, of very strong women. And the theme of cities for all is a great theme. But I'm going to expand it to the suburbs. Because most urbanists, I mean, how many of you are studying the suburbs? Okay, I got, got two half -see, half -sees. Um, Yeah, m I mean, this is typical. Most urbanists focus on downtowns. When I was in school, and when I started researching and studying this, I had other faculty telling me, you're not a true urbanist. If you were a true urbanist, you'd be working on downtowns. And I was like, no, the intellectual questions of the downtowns have pretty much already, your generation, you guys kind of solve them. We may not always be doing everything we should for the downtowns, but we at least know what we should be doing for our downtowns, for the most part, for our cities. The suburbs have, just, have sort of been held in disdain. Most urbanists are happy to critique them, and I'm very critical of the suburbs as well. Uh, I'm critical of suburban form as opposed, and I'm very, very, whereas, although I'm, and I'm very much an urbanist and interested in urban form. And very simply, I distinguish them as urban form means you have a box right up to a sidewalk, and if there's parking, it's, in, it's behind, or if there's a courtyard, it's behind. Suburban form, you have a box surrounded by flat land that is either grass or parking. And that's pretty much <laughs> the distinction. Uh, and yet there are so many ramifications that come from just that simple uh, distinction. So as, as Tigran mentioned, uh, June and I wrote this book. Um, and then and, and when we wrote this book, we had about 80 case studies um, strictly from North America, most of them US, but also quite a few in Canada. 
since then, I've been maintaining our database. We have, I have over 1,500 examples um, in the database of prototypical suburban property types, whether that's malls, uh, shopping malls, strip malls, shopping centers, uh, garden apartment complexes, big box stores, golf course communities, uh, you know, just the commercial strip corridors, all of these standard property types that have been built in a very formulaic manner. We have standardized them. And so I look at I, the, my 1,500 examples are of where those property types have been retrofitted one way or another into more sustainable places. And I'm not going to show you all 1,500. It might feel like it, but I promise I won't show you all of them. Um, so, you know, this, the Americans, I'm mostly really focusing on the post-war, post-World War II American suburban, that second half of the 20th centuries when we really started building the suburbs um, as the dominant of most of our construction, absolutely going to building suburban development. And it provided generations of Americans with access to the American dream. You know, and it's, it's, it, there are a lot of, the sort of pre-World War II, the first half of the 20th century, produced some quite lovely leafy suburbs that will hold value for many, many years. Uh, but the, the stuff we built in the second half, it's not aging very well. And there are a lot of unintended consequences, which I've sort of listed here. Uh, traffic is always the number one complaint. When we were building, first started building the suburbs, most households had one car. Today, most new homes, single family homes built in the US, have a three car garage. Uh, it's, you know, it was, we have become so auto oriented. And yet, because every, ne every neighborhood, the residential neighborhoods, don't want any cut through traffic, we've created a system where people live on cul-de-sacs and, you know, so that there's no possibility to cut through or an entire develop development has one entry in, one entry out. Uh, and so every trip is funneled onto the arterials where the strip malls and the malls and the big box stores and the office parks are. And so we end up with overused and over heavily congested arterials and then completely underused local streets. So that's been a vicious spiral we're still in. Um, climate change and sustainability. Nobody was using those words in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, nobody was really thinking about uh, these issues. And yet, Suburbanites have higher carbon footprints than urbanites. Why would that be? This is the interactive part. It's kind of obvious. Why would, why would suburbanites have a higher carbon footprint? Each one needs its own water. It's, well, it's the driving. I mean, all of that, they're, they're driving much, much more. And the second reason is, when you live with detached buildings, you tend to leak a lot more energy. And you tend to also, if you have a lawn, you tend to ridic a lot of water going into the lawn. And then that's requiring more energy to pipe. And uh. So living compactly ends up dramatically reducing water and energy use. If you can get people to live closer together with party walls like a townhouse or in flats. You're, lo you're, you're generally having less square footage per household. You're uh, not losing as much, ener as much energy and heat. And then when you've got more uses compactly, you're not having to drive as much or as far. All of that just adds up um, pretty dramatically. One of the less obvious um, sort of unintended consequences is on public health. Since the, uh, since the 19th century, the earliest sort of suburbs, um, the, the suburbs were always being sold and marketed as the healthy place to raise a family. Is that still sort of true in Sweden? Is, is there, 
a lot of that sort of image of, you know, really ideally you want that the family should be, have a yard and trees and kids can kind of play. Um, that image certainly has been true in the U.S. It's based on the 19th century health threats, which the big health threat in the 19th century was the fear of infectious diseases from overcrowded cities. Today, is that our biggest health threat? No, not at all. There's flu goes around and you know, we're not free of infectious diseases, but our biggest health threat, uh, certainly in the US and in most of the developed world, are now chronic diseases that have to do with our behavior. And in particular, obesity is at epidemic levels in the US. That then triggers heart disease, diabetes, um, as the number one um, just kind of killers. And you know, so sadly, that human sprawl correlates with suburban sprawl. People leading very sedentary lifestyles sitting at home in front of the TV, sitting at work and in the office, sitting in the car, drive, commuting back and forth. Uh, and so that we see, so that suddenly, it's not to say that cities are necessarily so much healthier, but in general, any people who live in cities walk more. They are more physically active than people living um, out in the suburbs. Plus all the deaths by automobile crashes, um, Suicide, other things all tend to go up uh, out, the further out one gets. The other issues that have really reached quite a crisis level in the US are affordability. The suburbs, kind of the image of the suburbs is that that's where the American middle class lives. That the suburbs are the affordable, there are wealthy suburbs, there are poor suburbs, but the, the perception is that the suburbs are mostly middle class. Um, that perception is increasingly untrue. We ha it's, we're becoming much more divided between the extremely rich and the extremely poor. The middle class is emptying out. And where we see that in urban terms is that in particular, the American provision of affordable housing has mostly been in terms of not public sector affordable housing, but just in terms of uh, developers building houses that are affordable to ordinary middle class families has been based on what's always been called drive till you qualify because the city, the cheaper land in the city is always the, that which is out at the furthest edge. And so the new starter homes, the new affordable housing is always just that much further out than the last one going out, ever going after that cheaper land. Now in a small city, okay, you might have enough cheap land around for that to last for uh, several decades. But we've reached the point, so where I live in Atlanta now, the people who, the, who most need that cheap affordable housing, it now comes with the most expensive transportation costs because they are living so far out after 10, 12 miles, um, the savings of the cheap house are completely wiped out by the higher transportation costs. We're also beginning to real recognize that all of those roads that were built in the 50s and 60s and the sewer lines and the power lines and the water mains, after 40, 50 years, it depends on which of those infrastructures, it's time to maintain them. And suddenly building at low density has meant you don't have enough people's taxes to cover the maintenance cost of rebuilding all those roads. The initial cost was essentially given to the cities. They were like, great, you know, the developer's building it. They're just giving us the roads, you know, and it's like so far away, but the um, maintenance costs are, are absolutely soaring. And there are uh, suburbs in the US that have now turned all of their cul-de-sac roads into and uh, privatized them and just given them to the residents and say, it's your problem. You now have an extra long driveway. You have to pave, plow, maintain your road. Uh, 
Then the, the, lastly, I mean, the, the consequence that, again, also I think really kind of shocks people is that, that since 2005, more Americans in poverty have been living in the suburbs than living in cities. And that re it's, it's kind of invisible. People have, it, the US, I think, has always tended to, you know, the, the term inner city is often assumed to refer to the inner city poor. Well, we know our cities ha are, have attracted tremendous revitalization, a lot of uh, increase in incomes. Now, that hasn't forced all the poor out, but it's forced many of the poor further out. At the same time, we had this recession where the people who had you know, bought that new home way, way out, and then the gas prices spiked, they, could, they, for, they missed a mortgage payment, they foreclosed on their home, suddenly it's the outer ring, the people the furthest out, the elite who are on these subprime mortgages, they really shouldn't have bought in the first place, shouldn't have been sold to them in the first place. Um, so you've got, a, suddenly you have an enormous, uh, the suburbanization of poverty has been sort of an enormous uh, story. In my city, in Atlanta, we were, number one in the rate of the suburbanization of poverty uh, during the recession, 159% uh, increase in five years. So, and that's poverty that now is getting people sort of uh, having to make a choice often between do I pay the mortgage on the house or do I pay the car payment? And most of them are going to choose the car because I can at least sleep in the car and then maybe I can still get a job, at least get to a job. Because otherwise, there's very little transit in the US uh, once you're out in the suburbs. So that access to opportunity, the access to institutions that help the suburban poor is very minimal. And there's a huge, a lot of catch up going on right now. But basically, whatever issue you're interested in, whether it's climate change, demographic change, poverty and affordability, you know, the suburbs are really the new territory <laughs> where these problems um, are, I think, actually impacting the highest numbers of people in the, in the US and yet are the least, it's in the suburbs. We don't look, you know, urbanists don't, don't tend to look at the problems when they're out in the suburbs. And they're so diffuse, they're not as visible. So adding to, um, adding to that, the sort of depressing um, realities, we have a lot of dead, dying, vacant buildings. At one point or, an, or another, we have 1,500 properties that were enclosed shopping malls. A third of them have already died. We're down to 1,032. And of those 1,032, at least another third or a quarter are expected uh, to die pretty, pretty soon. Strip malls, big box stores, we don't even know the full count. There just are, there are lots of dead ones. Suburban office is another really interesting and um, I think you know, very um, frightening prospect for a lot of communities. They depend on the, the tax, their tax base. Uh, they depend a lot on that, those office, suburban office. And uh, as the cities have been reinvested in, um, as that's where the new, young, digitally, no, digerati, uh, kind of younger people tend to want to live and work in the suburbs. I mean, work in the cities now. The same corporations that fled cities in the 1980s to the suburban office parks now are going back and fleeing, and we're seeing a lot of empty office. So I, I'm not an expert on the relevance of these questions here. So I wanna just plant this seed in your heads and then maybe at the end we can have a discussion. How relevant um, are these issues in Sweden? Suburbs, suburban form looks really very different in different parts of the world. Um, yet, it does, certainly in my experience, the buildings we built in the 50s and 60s and 70s anywhere in the world are falling apart. And they're tending not to be, to age very well. So they're, they're eligible for historic preservation. Some of them are, some of them shouldn't be. Uh, 
So, you know, the, there's needs and, and opportunities. I mean, you can either, when I look at all of these dead and dying properties, most people just get depressed. And they're like, ugh, it's so ugly. It's awful having all this dead stuff around. I look at this and say, opportunity. This is the new cheap land. We don't have to go tear down another tree ever, ever again. We have so much just asphalt, underperforming, suburban dead dying properties. This is where all the, of our new redevelopment should be occurring. And frankly, we'll still never urbanize or redevelop all of it. Um, now what about in Sweden? You know, the building types, the transportation modes are quite different. Um, you guys have a lot more transit in your suburbs than, than the US does. Um, but you also, I believe, have some issues with the suburbanization of poverty. It's taken something of a different form. Um, but, I, you know, do you also have problems of inadequate social capital, inadequate access to jobs for those living in the periphery? Um, are there opportunities to, you know, retrofit some of your suburban, whether it's the million homes, whether it's the office parks? Um, you know, so bear that in mind, but I'm going to just focus on the U.S. examples. <laughs> so the reason I have over 1,500 examples in my, um, my database in the U.S. is because developers have begun to absolutely realize this is the new cheap land. And that these, so, um, and they've begun to recognize that suburbia isn't as suburban <laughs> as it used to be. Uh, for one thing, it always surprises people. We think of the suburbs as family focused. That's not who lives there. Since 2000, two thirds of suburban households have not had children in them. The suburbs are mostly made up of aging baby boomers, my generation. We raised our kids, most of the boomers were the babies who the post-war suburbs were built for. And then they raised their children in the suburbs. And now the, 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 the kids have fledged and <laughs> moved on. And you've got a lot of aging folks starting to hit retirement, living in the suburbs. Um, so they're, and they're a big generation. Then the generation after them, Gen X, is a much smaller generation. Most of Gen X is also living in the suburbs, and they're in prime child rearing years in their 30s and 40s, and most of them do have kids. But again, they're, they're small. There just aren't enough Gen Xers to fill all the existing single family homes currently occupied by aging baby boomers. Then you get Gen Y. The folks in, mostly in their 20s, early 30s, uh, most of your generation. They are, you guys are in the US, you're even bigger generation than, um, than the baby boomers. Most of your generation in the US grew up in the suburbs and you think they're really, really boring. And you really don't want to own a car and you really don't, you know, I mean, just there's, but you're starting, you've put off child, you've put off marriage, put off having kids longer than any generation in history before, but you're starting to have kids and just starting. And so the, and the big question is, will the mom and pop millennials sort of move into the suburbs for the same reasons that generations before them did? Uh, but right now, what's really happening, we're seeing this interesting convergence of the two biggest target markets, the boomers and the millennials, or Gen Ys, same thing, um, they're both, the boomers are living in the suburbs, but as they're hitting retirement, they, they want to age in their same community with their doctors, with, with their friends, but the big house, the, they loved the privacy while they were raising kids. Now that they are retired and there's no kids, it's lonely. And they're actually finding, you know, I want to stay in the same community, but actually I want to be able to walk to places. I want to volunteer in different organizations. I want to be active. I don't want to just be shut away in this house. 
Um, so they're actually looking for a more urban lifestyle, but in the suburbs. So, and meantime, the millennials, they grew up watching Seinfeld and Friends. They love the idea of being in the city. Uh, they want an urban lifestyle, but the majority of jobs, over 82% of US jobs are more than three miles from the central business district. Our downtowns really are just a small portion of our jobs. Most of the jobs are out in the suburbs. So you've got this generation that want urban lifestyle, but their jobs are actually out in, an, in office parks. And some, so you, when you put those two markets together, you've got an, actually an enormous um, group of, uh, of our demographic that are not families, family households, but who want that urban lifestyle in the suburbs. Now what's also been, so that's a huge driver of the suburban redevelopment. What also is happening is that the, this process of drive till you qualify and constant development just leapfrogging, going further and further out. The process stole market share from those early first ring suburbs. When a new mall opened up, oh, that's the new shiny mall. Everybody wants to go to that mall and the old mall kind of loses a little bit. And that's part of why we're seeing so many dying malls. Not the end online shopping. Um, but and the same was true with neighborhoods. The same was true with everything. The process took away market share and a lot of those earlier suburbs really got kind of seedy. Uh, they lost value. But it's been going on so long, it's now given them something way more valuable, which is a relatively central position in a now expanded metro. So that now suddenly, this slide is in Atlanta. Um, this is at the center there. This is Perimeter Center Mall. Now the name alone tells you, you know, what? How can you be a perimeter and a center? Make up your mind. You're one or the other. Um, it's right on the perimeter highway, so it, that's sort of why. But when it was built, this was the cheap land. This was the edge of Atlanta. People loved bit living here, and you know, downtown's behind us. We're looking at prairie. We're happy. Very suburban. We're going to drive everywhere. The modern life, the good life of, of the sort of at that, at that time. Now it's sort of an edge city. Any, it's, there's a lot of office parks, malls, shopping. So anyone from Atlanta who kind of, you know, if you, you say, you can't build anything more at Perimeter Center. It's totally built out. Well, that slide is about 80% surface parking lots. If you start thinking of your surface parking lots as future building sites, there's obviously enormous potential. And that's exactly what's happening. So right now, currently under construction, over 7 million square feet of new walkable mixed use development. The mall is still there, <laughs> um, but just, in, and it's all, what's coming in is much more urban in form, much more, you know, ground floor is walkable. Um, and this is just one, place you know, where we're seeing this. This one happens to have a transit station, and that's why there's so much of it happening here, especially so much of it being office uh, that's actually uh, coming in. But um, it's also, you know, so because there's so much demand for, the, for more walkable urbanism, now uh, Chris Leinberger is a professor at George Washington University who has been asking the question, how much real estate value does walkability add to real estate? And I mean, 30, 40 years ago, the cities were, had, had not been invested in, they were kind of nasty, the subways weren't air conditioned anymore in New York, and, you know, and, and walkable urbanism was losing value, and it was all about the shiny new office park, the shiny new subdivision. And it's completely flipped. Now uh, we are seeing just the premiums for walkable urbanism uh, significantly going up. In Atlanta, it's 112% average rent premium, 74% um, nationwide. 
just so that's part of what is driving this. More and more people want that urban lifestyle wherever they can get it. <laughs> and most of that is actually, it's in the suburbs where you've got all these parking lots um, where you've got the space to really, to really do it. Um, so, one, I, I'm an urban designer, so the way that I really, that June and I look at these, all of these case studies that we have, one way we, just, we kind of parse them out is by just looking at the, dividing them into three very simple, very basic urban design strategies. So one is redevelopment. Demolish most of what's there if, uh, you know, and just, and sort of build urbanism instead. Densify, urbanize, and diversify. So this is the very first of the uh, dead malls that was uh, redeveloped. So here, this is um, Meisner Park. When it died, uh, they stopped paying taxes. The land defaulted to the city. The city set up a redevelopment authority. And while they owned it, the, the city said, you know, we need more open space. We want, so we, we want to see this site redeveloped, but two thirds of the land, we want to be park space. So the new design has a linear park leading to a little more of a park and amphitheater back there. It's then flanked by retail at the ground floor and apartments and office up above. It's been added to seven times each time at a somewhat higher price point. Um, so, and it's now the second largest uh, generator of tax revenue for the city of, uh, of Boca Raton. So suddenly all these, the 500 other cities with dead malls <laughs> um, around are going, we, we want to do, <laughs> we want to do what they did. Uh, but it won't work everywhere because when a mall dies, you have to find out why. If the reason the mall died is because the steel mills closed and there's no more middle class jobs that can support the kind of consumerism uh, that the mall was based on, you're not going to be able to support a particularly urban fabric. On the other hand, in this particular case, if it was two malls were competing against each other and one won, one lost, but there's actually still a market for something other than a mall, then, you know, then suddenly and, and you've got the, the opportunity to actually really make mixed use um, work much, much better. So, but, but it's really important. Most, the communities, Every, I do a lot of consulting to mayors um, of cities with dead malls that, you know, what can we do? And they all want the redevelopment. Um, and that's just not always going to work. So often in weaker markets, re-inhabitation with more community serving uses is a fantastic option. It doesn't necessarily uh, re you know, you're basically keeping the existing box, just putting in some new uses. And uh, you may not really be changing the urbanism as much as one might like to see, but you're, it's a great way to relocalize uh, the businesses, relocalize the sense of place, um, relocalize the kind of landscaping, the, the, the flora and fauna. Uh, so this is an example of Willingboro Town Center. This was one of the very first uh, Levitt towns, right after the original Levitt town was in Long Island. This is down in New Jersey. Um, and so there's a whole Levitt town community back there, but this was their commercial strip with a series of big uh, Sears. Well, we're, these are all sort of big, um, popular, at the time, uh, chain, sto chain stores. They had all completely died by the 90, late 90s. Um, and so in the early 2000s, Willingboro removed one box and put in a little town square, depaved a good portion of the parking lot, put in to, so that they could capture and clean a lot of the runoff, but also really make it uh, say, you know, we don't need all that asphalt now. Um, they've got a library moved into the old power plant. Um, a health center moved into the old Sears. Uh, there's a community college that's moved in. Now there's some more retail has built along the sides. But, you know, but it's for very little money, I mean, very little. They didn't build a lot. They actually extracted a little bit. 
Um, but they made a town center a re, you know, out for almost no money, a very local place. The third strategy is re-greening, which personally is the one that I'm like advocating and fighting the most for. We don't have enough financial tools yet to make this, to do this. Um, only 2% so far of my case studies are the re-greenings. But it's really important to recognize but that before 1972, which was when the US signed the Clean Water Act, requiring uh, much more attention to water, much of the suburbs were built, we just culverted the creeks, we drained the wetlands. It was normal practice. Let's just build anywhere we want um, and forget about, we'll just put the water in pipes. Well, as in this example, not only did the strip mall die, the culvert underneath the strip mall has died. So the creek that had been culverted, on the wetland in this case, um, you know, failed and so now it's perking, the water is perking up. It happened to be on a major migratory bird route. So for purely ecological reasons, uh, the local university was able to help the community get a grant to reconstruct the wetland. And they built, they really built a quite a beautiful wetland. In the process, that created lakefront property, which also attracted the first new private development um, in over 40 years to a very, very low-income neighborhood. And that's very often the case, that the regreening, when done well, a well-designed park tends to increase adjacent property values up to 30%. So a well-designed park can help to bring development to areas uh, that, are, that really are in need of it. Um, and then there's lots of, you know, lots of other things that, that, that uh, the regreening um, becomes, I think, really important for. So what, um, what I'm going to do now is, 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 is sort of, June and I are working on a second book, slowly, um, and the way we're organizing this book is to talk about what are these 21st century challenges that the suburbs were never designed for, that the retrofits become the opportunity to finally really begin to address. So I'm going to focus on auto dependence is still, that is just the number one issue uh, in the US. And it has so many cascading benefits. It affects everything else. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, some of the retrofits that really do good things for auto by reducing auto dependence. I'll talk a little bit about these issues. I'm not going to talk about these because I think Stockholm, you guys are already really doing some awesome um, stuff on those issues, and there's only so much time. So, <laughs> um, so auto dependence. Um, and it, this is again, where, you know, again, the, I'm jealous of Sweden. You have so many more bike paths and so much more transit than than we do. Um, so the, the problem is not as severe, uh, I think, here, but it's actually kind of surprising that the motor vehicles um, per thousand cabinets, you're not that far behind us. You're, you're good far behind us, but you're not that far behind us. So these are some of the strategies that are being employed to try to reduce that auto dependence. So let me start with, this is one of the oldest of the retrofits, Mashpee Commons up in Cape Cod was a little family-owned strip, what we call a strip mall, uh, just open air, it's not enclosed, sitting on a vast parking lot. The family that owned it recognized that it, it was tired, it was pretty much done. I don't know why the year switched over, sorry, that 2025 should be over there. <laughs> um, but the, uh, they wanted to really sort of, you know, said, we need to reinvest, it's, it's gotten tired. We want to try to build a New England village. Well, that's illegal according to all of the codes, but they brought in Dwani Plater Zyberg, a leading new urbanist firm. This was really quite early, 1988, um, who sort of just said, well, we're gonna just start building on top of the parking lots with retail at grade, modest apartments up above, very simple. It took them 20 years to just bit by bit build on top of the parking lot. They actually, it was illegal to have on-street parking. So in the legal documents that, to get the permits, they, 
instead of calling their streets streets, they called the streets parking lots because that's what they already were. <laughs> that was how they were kind of allowed to do this. It's gotten easier to do this stuff now. It is actually legal. So now they're, for the next 25 years, they've gotten permission um, to build much more compact developments and connect them. Um, but it, the, the simple strategy of just incrementally building on top of the parking lots is really sort of this, this is one strategy. Now part of that incremental growth, very simple and modest, has been to use little liner buildings. These little skinny guys, which screen the parking and then mean that when you're inside walking on this street, it still feels proportionally like an enclosed street. These guys are also deliberately designed to be movable. Uh, they're about, and they're also designed to be too <coughs> narrow for the chain re national chain retailers. So this is, these are deliberately designed to give more window space to help the entrepreneurial uh, lo small local businesses which have the highest failure rate, but they also generate the most sales per square foot when they're successful. And they help to make the place, you know, have that local feel. So this develop, these developers really wanted to have that local business incubator, and that's really what those little liner guys um, have done. And, so, and that's been one of those sort of incremental strategies. Those guys have moved around a couple times. Uh, Lots of great uses for liner buildings, but that's one of the incremental strategies. Another is to actually design parking lots as future building sites. So this was a case where um, this was a three-story big suburban shopping mall surrounded by parking. Uh, when the mall died, they kept one of the department stores, turned it into a civic center, uh, but it was also on the Tr new Transit, Denver, this is outside Denver, uh, New Transit line. This was w the very first line that was being built. And there was only enough market to really support urban development with buildings facing each other across a street and a plaza. There was only that much market for the urban. There was still, most of the market was still demanding suburban big Walmart right there. So here, you know, you're looking at the Walmart standing, I'm, I'm looking at the Walmart, I took that photo. Uh, so, but they knew at the time, it's like, you know, we're putting in transit. Once the, the transit system has been more fully built out, there will be a lot of demand for urbanism at the transit station. It's just too soon right now. So they t asked Walmart, they said, instead of doing your sewer hookup diagonally across the, underneath the parking lot to wherever the closest hookup is, Put it in the drive lanes of your parking lot so that these parking lots are actually just waiting. We all know a Walmart is not going to last very, very long. Um, so, and the tr street trees are also, uh, they've got some street trees they've put in so that it's, they're just sort of waiting. We don't know when the market, we don't know when the market will flip. We don't know when the Walmart, um, Will, will die, but we're anticipating and designing for that. So that's another one of these kind of slow, incremental uh, strategies. This is the opposite. This is what you do in a really strong market uh, with developers who are actually really eager um, to, to retrofit. So this is uh, an area known as White Flint because that's the name of, that's the subway station. Um, right there. It's North Bethesda, Maryland, about a, about a half hour subway ride from Washington, D.C. And it centers on Rockville Pike, which is an eight lane nasty highway. I've walked it. There are sidewalks. You can walk there, but it's nobody wants to. It's a very underused metro station because it's so miserable when you get out. There's some office, there's some apartments, there's a mix of uses, but it's totally auto-oriented. Looks like a lot of Atlanta, actually, suburban Atlanta. Um, so the county had a new planning director who said, all right, we wanna do a new plan, sector plan 
for this and try to start retrofitting. This was, and again, being only a half hour outside of DC and on transit, there's a strong market. So the developers, there's six property owners who own most of the property within this 400 acre area. The six major property owners told the planning director, let us have a try before you do it. So they then brought in a really good um, transportation planning firm, Gladding Jackson, and said, they said, we want walkable urbanism. These same developers owned property in other parts of DC that were more walkable. And they said, we're getting double the rents in Bethesda that used to look like us, but invested in walkable urbanism. We want, how, give, help us figure out. So every one of these dotted lines is a new street going in on being paid for. The developers have agreed to an additional tax of about 10% that is paying for the construction of public streets on their privately owned land. In exchange, they get permission to build up to 30 stories. If they build all the way to 30 stories, they also have to purchase transfer of development rights to help preserve uh, countryside in the county. So a lot of kind of interesting things. The, the city in the meantime, the county, has agreed, they haven't gotten funding yet, but to also try to retrofit Rockville Pike itself with a bus rapid transit system and a median running down the center to expand access to the metro station, uh, road diet, reducing the lanes to six, and much wider sidewalks. So um, here's already the first 30-story building. Um, this is the second one on what used to be a fast food restaurant site. Um, this is a 30-acre strip mall. Here's what it looked like about two years ago, and here's what the presumed uh, final, um, you know, so it's just rap rapidly urbanizing. This is the sidewalk right in front of that building. Um, a quite beautiful bioswale that's actually all made with native stone and kind of tells a story about the geology but also the sound of, the, of water kind of trickling down actually does make it decently pleasant at the moment to walk by the, big, the really bad highway. But it's establishing a level of investment in pedestrian infrastructure uh, that is, I think, really, really important. So this project, they broke ground, the first building broke, new building broke ground six years after the initial nudge from the planning director which is kind of rocket speed compared to um, a lot of other places. And just to give you a little uh, background, just sort of, a, you know, how, so here, 1950, this was, the, this was all farmland, and here's the first subdivision. By 1970, oh, we got a lot of subdivision. Now we've got Rockville Pike and a lot of commercial, bigger, big buildings coming in along the pike. By 1990, there's a big mall has come in as well. Um, and additionally now, uh, the, some tra the transit, train line, oh, there, that's the train, yeah, now the, uh, also the, this line. So now we've got the mall has died, um, a lot more of it, you know, we're, the new plan has been adopted and here's the expected uh, build out pretty soon. So all of what I've been showing is in blue, now they're expanding it to the gray and there will be a third stretch going up there. And that's the next metro stop. And we start to see how, um, meanwhile, up there, even before the White Flint project, there was a dead mall um, that what, and strip mall that was converted into a new town, town square, mixed use, um, very well done project next to a train station. And you start to see how this is. You know, it started as kind of incremental, this project, then that project, then this project, and now it's really a regional shifting away of getting more people onto the transit, off of the highway, um, and just, you know, boom, 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 boom. And it's not really, you know, so we're, there are strong markets and there are weak markets. This one is a very strong market, and that's kind of why a lot of this is happening. Um, and so now also, more of the new putting how to go into fa urban fabric like this, buildings and parking lots, 
This was a 5,600 foot long single block, basically a mile long block. <laughs> and now it's, the plan is to try to do the same thing as at White Flint and get the private property owners to actually pay to put in the new street grid. Um, so this just sort of gives you a, a, the range. In the meantime, on the ground, um, the new projects really do, are putting in a lot of attention to the pedestrian eye. You know, it's a lot of ground floor retail, street furnishings, public spaces, detail, craft. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of work happening at both the regional scales and um, certainly then at that, at that pedestrian scale, which I think it makes it so important. More typical, uh, though, you know, where that, that is when it's just a single property owner then decides to try to redevelop. So this is Belmar. Which this was um, a 100-acre super block, you know, single block with a big mall on it. Uh, here's sort of what it looked like in its heyday. Um, today, it's 22 walkable blocks with uh, public streets and retail at ground and apartments and office above on two of the major streets, and the rest is a mix of different kinds of housing. Uh, really, I think, very well done, um, and it's generating four times the tax revenue that the mall did at its peak. It tripled density on the site, but did not have to widen any of the nearby streets or add any new traffic lights because the mix of uses allows so many of the trips to now be in captured internally. So there's a lot of, of stories of, you know, it's, it's more anecdotal, but just, you know, people who live there saying, you know, yeah, I commute to work, but once I'm home, that's it. I don't get in the car again. That's my own, you know, I, all, the rest of my trips are just walking in the neighborhood. And it's got great connectivity uh, to the, now the streets around it. So, but, so here, this shows Belmar six miles from downtown Denver. The other dots are the 13 regional malls in the Denver area. Eight of them have now been retrofitted which is so just sort of go, you know, so you begin to kind of see one scenario kind of figures out how to do that. Now, what's important about this is it didn't tear down a single, single family house. It didn't remove any choices about how to live uh, for the existing, you know, people who, it's, who are already living there. It simply added the choice of how to live for, for that growing market that wants a more urban lifestyle in a suburban location, that's what these guys uh, you know, are, now, are now providing. But it also points out that, okay, so we get these little pockets of drive to walkability. If we really want to get a more, sustain more sustainability, we have to literally connect the dots and that means to, to begin to retrofit the corridors themselves. Sometimes it's as modest as starting by just retrofitting an intersection. So this is in Washington, D.C. There's a metro station right about there. And then this intersection was completely designed for cars, really wide turning radii, <coughs> making it really hard for pedestrians to cross the street and get to the metro station. So the director of pl city planning at, uh, in Washington said, I want that returned to a 90 degree intersection. I want to privilege the pedestrians. The cars can stop and wait. And in the process, I want to recover all that public land and now give that to a developer who's going to build uh, affordable housing close to the transit station. And that's exactly what's happened. So this Walmart, uh, so you've got affordable retail with apartments above is on that site. This site is about to get uh, some market rate housing senior ho and affordable senior housing to replace the units that are already there. Um, and you know, it's a pretty cool, whoops, pretty cool project. Uh, another one of my favorites of the corridor retrofits, there's, so, there's lots of them, but um, 
This one is a suburb of Los Angeles where this was the main street of Lancaster, California. They'd been losing shot, a lot of their retail to the mall in the next door town for years. And the answer had always been, well, we need to make it easier for people to get to downtown, so let's widen the main street. Well, that just made it easier for people to zip through, and it was posted at 50 miles an hour. So, um, and this is a typical, very typical in the US, the five laner, which is basically two lanes in each direction, and then the middle lane, which will, is the left turn lane, um, and you know, it sort of sh shimmies in the middle. So then they, they did, it, that wasn't work, the widening clearly wasn't working, so then they did the opposite. They put their main street on a road diet. It went from five lanes to two. They put the parking in the middle, in between street lights and street trees. And they reduced the speed limit to 20. There's a saying in the US, 20 is plenty. If a pedestrian is hit by a car going 22 miles an hour, chances are the pedestrian lives. If the car is going 23 miles an hour, no. We should never have speeds higher than 20 anywhere we are trying to encourage walkability and want, you know, people. What, so on the one hand you think, oh my God, this, how can you do that? How can you go from 50 miles an hour in five lanes to 20 miles an hour in two lanes? It must be a traffic disaster. No, at 50 miles an hour, cars have to be really far apart. And when they have multiple lanes, they're, zoom, they're, they're jogging, juggling for a position. At 20 miles an hour, the cars can be very close together. You actually get just as much throughput, and, but they're no longer juggling, they're just going down the one lane. Also, at 20 miles an hour, they can actually, somebody can actually see, oh, there's a sale at such and such. Mm, pull into the parking and, and stop in. It's also created, a, now, this, quite wonderful place. So they have farmers markets, they have events there, they now have a sort of public celebratory space. They've reclaimed, you know, most of the time it's used as parking. They've reclaimed that public space of the street now as also a public activity space. Um, I was out there this summer and just went in to get a nice tea, started talking to the lady at the tea shop and, oh yeah, I almost, I looked at opening my shop at the mall. They still call me. They want me to come to the mall, but no, I just prefer the, the vibe here. This is a real place. Um, and this is a really, a very low income community that I think is just doing really, really smart uh, things. They did not change curb and gutter, so it was not that expensive to just add the trees um, and the lights. And it's had a lot of um, really, impactful, good impact on new businesses, um, cutting traffic, a lot of those things. So one more of the, um, the corridor retrofits. This one has been interesting to watch because it just continues to evolve. So this is Northern Virginia, uh, outside of Washington, D.C., kind of suburban Washington, D.C., and this is the before, and yet, you know, a uh, lot of one-story retail, but you also there were some of these older apartment buildings. Um, so for this three and a half mile stretch, um, they brought in con some c really good consultants who proposed upzoning at the four major intersections with a form-based code. So the difference between you know, regular codes um, in the US, what we call our Euclidean zoning, is based on uses. A form-based code is, says, oh, the uses will come and go. What the neighborhood really cares about is the form. So in this case, you, developers are told, look, we don't want you to set back from the sidewalk. We want you to build right up to the sidewalk and make it, make it urban, and you're allowed to build up to 12 stories at the sidewalk. But as you get back into the neighborhood, you've got to taper down to three, where you meet the existing homes in the neighborhood. Now, how exactly you do that? They're not going to tell you exactly what colors, what materials, but they're at least the massing. A good form-based code 
the, before there's a particular project uh, being considered, the planners are meeting with the community and saying, what kind of development do you want? What, kind, you know, what do you really care about? And getting that into the code. And then the developers are actually know that they're not going into a negotiated process. They're, they know that, OK, if I come up with a project that meets the massing, I'm guaranteed a permit. This particular corridor had not seen any new investment in 30 years other than one drugstore, that CVS. It took, was a year-long negotiation to get a brick facade on the CVS. Still has the same parking lot. <laughs> it didn't really change anything. But um, since the form-based code was adopted, in the middle of the recession of the US, six new 12, 14-story buildings. Uh, so form-based codes, in some markets anyway, when what done well, can actually trigger a lot of uh, redevelopment. Now, the downside of this one was, though, that so they, they, they deliberately were upzoning at the intersections. Um, they were trying to preserve the existing affordable housing, these sort of bigger 60s housing projects in between. However, um, and then the, what they were also proposing was that the additional tax revenue from all this new density would go to support a streetcar. We know that if you bring a streetcar into the suburbs, that increases property values and density, and, you know, and you'll, you'll get ridership. This was trying to do it in reverse, trying to say, can, can we, through zoning, allow that density, capture the value, and use that to then bring in transit? Just the hint that transit was coming mm -hmm. meant that the rents on the affordable housing whew, skyrocketed. And so uh, the county's been trying all sorts of, uh, they've now expanded the form-based code two blocks in either direction, along the width. They're doing a whole bunch of other things to try now after the fact um, to recapture some of that. And in fact, then the last election, um, folks said, no, the only way to preserve that affordable housing is to kill the transit. Mm -hmm. So we've actually, the transit is now on hold. So it's an interesting dialogue. And it's something that I think what we're seeing in the US is that transit is so desirable. It's like the gas, pouring gasoline on gentrification and blowing it up. Um, we all want to see more transit. But it's also, it is, it, it triggers accelerated uh, gentrification. And um, I really hope the transit will come back. I think there are a whole lot of other strategies. This county has a 116 point matrix of affordable things they're trying to do to try to preserve affordable housing. Um, but it's really, it's really, really hard. But so this gets me to that next challenge, the equity and affordability. So the building types in the US of affordable housing in the suburbs are mostly what we call garden apartment complexes. Do you guys know what I mean when I say garden apartment complex? As opposed to an, ur if you think of an urban apartment, it's an urban building. It might have a courtyard, but it's basically, um, you know, I think you guys all, we all know kind of what an urban apartment building. The garden apartments tend to be laid out as almost looks like a train wreck of cars and parking. There's very little garden, actually. Um, but they're, they're multifamily apartment buildings. And they're typically in, behind the strip malls and in front of the single family home neighborhoods. They kind of take that leftover space. Um, and they were, they, we built a lot of them in the 50s and 60s. They are aging out in, in Atlanta, our central county, Fulton County, where most of the city of Atlanta is. We lost 8,000 units of garden apartments between um, 2008 and 2016, average age 1959, simply because they were falling apart. I mean, older garden apartments are often moldy, unhealthy, pretty horrible places to live. Um, but they're also all, usually the housing of last resort for the people who, can, who have the least amount of funds. And we have not, I, Fulton County has not replaced 8,000 units of affordable housing um, in those same years. And we haven't even hit the peak yet. 
Uh, the garden apartment complexes I think, it, it worry me enormously. Uh, the loss of, of the, uh, you know, the, the answer isn't just we should preserve these, but we need to certainly address the housing that, is that, is, that we're losing. Um, there's extended stay motels. We're seeing um, very poor families will, you know, live in their car for three weeks and then get an extended stay motel for one week and then go back into the... There are um, really depressing films, uh, again, around Atlanta. Um, I, I've had students go out and film school buses stopping at extended stay motels and letting off lots of school children because that's, that's where they're living. Um, and then somewhat surprisingly, as far as where the, um, what's happening in the suburbs, again, we think of single family homes in the suburbs as being mostly owner occupied. And that's still true, they are mostly owner occupied. But 25% uh, of single family homes in the US are rentals. And that number is continuing to grow um, big time. In Atlanta, it's 30%. So lots of, again, lots of strategies, that, different kinds of strategies that are, be, are used to try to help promote more equity and more affordability in the suburbs. Um, I'll run through uh, a few of these. So on the one hand, what we are seeing also is uh, these older motels becoming permanent housing for the homeless. It's not a great location, <laughs> but you're fi we're finding the, the home a lot of homeless right now get vouchers from the state and they daily, they don't know where they're sleeping that not each every night. They don't have an address. They can't possibly get a job without an address. And this at least gives people um, an address. It's just the most immediate thing. So we're finding sort of older motels or use can be useful um, for that. Um, this also, uh, for the homeless, is interesting. We're saying golf courses have been dying at an enormous rate. It's basically aging out. A lot of golf course communities, they're now senior housing <laughs> communities, basically. Um, and so this is the uh, golf course. It's kind of ironic. The golf country club has been turned into gardens to feed and provide jobs for the homeless. Um, and there's a lot of other, lots of other golf course retrofits. But, um, but it's, it's more that, you know, the, the location of, I think, housing um, for the poor is, is also the really significant thing is if we, we need to connect affordable housing to affordable transportation, just providing more affordable housing on its own really doesn't help nearly as much. Denver has been building an enormous transit system, and so now they've also started a revolving fund called their ETOD for Equitable TOD Fund that enables the acquisition of retrofit land about a half mile from all where the new transit stations are going. So they're not trying to get the land right at the station. That's really expensive. <laughs> but if you can go, but it, you know, as soon as you get about a half mile away, it's still a ten, only a 10 minute walk to the station, you can purchase um, more land. So, this is an example of a parking lot for a, of a strip mall that has now uh, been built with apartments for, that are all very low, low income apartments and a new public library um, on that site. Or another example of connecting affordable housing to affordable transportation, in this case, with an existing transportation network that was just very underused. So on Long Island, uh, outside of New York City. The Long Island Railroad is a great commuter rail, but this particular town, Wyandanch, is really the poorest community on the whole island. Um, and they didn't even have, there's no sewer in the town, very um, kind of low income and low investment. Um, the, what had been their downtown was completely ruined by just surface parking lots near the train station. So that's now, uh, they're completely redeveloping the area to get, bring a lot more housing choices and it, affordable housing, but not, but still new housing. And they're going to be able to pay for making Main Street a boulevard by paying for it because, well, we have to put in sewer now that we're going to this higher density and kind of you, you know, solving multiple problems um, at once. 
Uh, one more example of connecting affordable housing to affordable transportation, in this case, just on the site of a former gas station, gas stations are another use that are going away. Our cars are becoming more efficient, more and more electric. You've got all these cor kind of prime corner sites that don't need to be gas stations anymore. Um, this one has been, uh, is one of many examples redeveloped as affordable housing right on the bus route. Uh, you know, it's not ideal to be on a fairly busy street, uh, but that's part of what does make it affordable. And they, they claim that these recessed windows help to buffer the noise. I, I don't know. Um, but this is also an example of what increasingly in the US we're referring to as missing middle housing. So if we're the US, our housing industry is very good at building single family homes. And then we build five story multifamily because that can, that's as far as you can go on wood construction um, as far as you're allowed. And then if you're gonna pop up to concrete or steel, you've gotta go at least 15 stories for it to be remotely affordable. So whereas a lot of the towns, the historic neighborhoods that we all love had you know, three, four story apartment buildings, um, duplexes, quadplexes, uh, different kinds of density that provided more uh, for, s that were really great for smaller households. Uh, they helped to densify the neighborhood so that they could, the neighborhood could have more transit, have more uses. Um, and there's an, a, a lot of interest in trying to bring back those housing types, again, recognizing that our households are getting smaller. And so this is one example of missing, missing middle uh, housing. Um, this is another example. I like, th I like this one a lot. This is um, East Greenwich, Rhode Island is a, a relatively affluent community. And they, but they recognized, the city council said, we need so to build some affordable housing. So they targeted the former auto body repair lot, just a block off of Main Street. And then this was the first proposal that came in for the affordable housing. A double loaded corridor, big box plopped in the middle of the site. The neighbors freaked. They didn't want affordable housing in their neighborhood particularly anyway, and then you give them this out of scale, big box just plunked down. Then they hired one of my former students who gave them a cottage court. This is a classic sort of example of missing middle, a missing middle housing type. So these are 15 units on one acre, which is actually pretty high density, but it, they look so small and cute. <laughs> and they maintain the, context, the street, the rhythm, the scale, the context along the street in an absolutely graceful transition that makes them completely acceptable uh, design, you know, to the rest, to the neighborhood. So design really matters, whether you're designing in a very traditional kind of manner here or designing um, in more contemporary styles. I mean, the power of good design is, is, is absolutely essential, I think, at, um, at really understanding scale and how to work into neighborhoods. Now, the more common, unfortunately, is bad design. Um, so this is an example in, around, outside of Atlanta. Uh, it's a little hard to read, but here's, if you can, this is a garden apartment complex. If you can kind of see, it looks a little like, a, like train cars kind of in a train wreck there. It's just, you know, slab barrack apartment buildings surrounded by parking on a field of parking. Um, but so there were 523 units there, 60% Hispanic, 40% African American, and rents averaged five to $700 a unit. Um, it was rebuilt and you know, they kind of made an urban street here with a re ridiculously long building. Um, but you know, that, they, they, that, that building faces this building kind of across a street that's really a parking lot, you know, it's not really a street, but you know, they're trying. And then next door is a big <coughs> Target discount store with a huge parking lot. Um, but most 
egregious. So, and it, you know, it's added more density, and this is right near a transit stop, and you want more density near, near a transit stop, but now look at what the rents are. So, and this is typical. This is happening all over the place. So it's really, most of the time, you know, the Belmar, the de if you're redeveloping the dead malls, the dead office parks, golf courses, you're not displacing anybody. But as soon as you start redeveloping the garden apartments, then yes, you're really, you are definitely uh, displacing people. And this is a really nice example of um, what also, though, where re-inhabitation can become an amazing strategy. So this is a great story of um, this woman, Margie, was a property manager for a company that owned a whole bunch of these garden apartment complexes. And so she was the person who, if a tenant couldn't pay their rent, they came to Margie. And what she found over and over and over was that with this, the, the complex she was managing, that it was near the airport, uh, Atlanta has very large airport, uh, that her tenants would come to her and they were almost all single moms raising a bunch of kids. They're working a $10 an hour job at the airport. And if one of their kids gets sick, they miss a shift, they lose their job, and they have to move again. And the kids are only in the same school for six months at a time before they're just sort of moving around. The elementary school near this particular um, garden apartment complex was the worst in the state. The absolute bottom. So she did, Margie did one thing. She took one of the empty apartments and she re-inhabited it with an after-school program. And she got folks from her church to help her run an after-school program. What that one little change did was suddenly the kids got to know each other. The kids had a place to hang out. Through the kids, the moms start to meet each other. If somebody's kid gets sick, someone other mom covers for them, or someone at the daycare, at the, the after school would cover for them. Also, the kids are starting to learn more stuff. They're actually getting educated in the after school program. That school went from worst in the, to then best improvement rate, you know, in the county. That then actually uh, caught the attention of Margie's bosses, and they raised the rents because now they were in a better school district. And then, once they had the rents raised, they sold the building because they could sell it for more money. And Margie went, what? And then the new owners, of course, filled the apartment that had been the after school, and the school immediately dropped back down to worst in the state. I mean, it was just so unbelievably clear, the impact. So Margie then um, said, all right, I'm going to start just doing this on my own, <laughs> and I'm not going to let myself get sold out anymore. So she's just bought another garden apartment complex um, and is doing it again and now, you know, um, with her school and has started a fund to really just specifically invest in blighted apartment communities near failing elementary schools. So there are, there are you know, great souls out there doing amazing things. Um, but again, you know, more often what we're really seeing is the garden apartments are that sort of urban, re suburban renewal all over again. We're looking back to the same strategies of slum renewal that urban renewal did to the minority neighborhoods in the 50s and 60s and 70s. We're seeing it replay now in the suburban communities. Uh, Dunwoody, a relatively affluent community, a suburb of Atlanta, uh, genuinely does not have very many parks. So their parks and rec department was certainly legitimate in saying, well, we really need a, a new baseball park. But they then targeted the one affordable garden apartment complex in Dunwoody that happened to also have about 800 school kids, mostly Hispanic. Um, and these were not moldy, falling apart ap apartments. They were actually in really pretty decent shape. It got enough bad press the day of the referendum uh, that it didn't pass. But this is happening. Uh, I mean, it's just we're seeing a lot of this uh, sort of un, uh, removal happening in the, in the name of regreening. Now, just down the road from that project, 
Um, there are other property owners who are embracing the new faces of suburbia. So again, not unlike uh, Sweden and most of Europe, the US now, most new immigrants land in the suburbs, not in the cities. We used to have Chinatowns, Korea towns were always right in the center of the city. Not, that's not been true for about 20 years. So um, this uh, particular property was a mall that started, it's about uh, 10 miles outside of Atlanta along a Buford Highway, um, which is where a lot of immigrants have been settling. And this mall was originally the Buford Claremont Mall. When there were a lot of Asian immigrants, it became Oriental Gardens. And then after a 260% increase in Hispanics, it was rethemed as Plaza Fiesta. And what the owner himself, uh, Mexican American, did was he took the, one of the two of the department stores, actually, of the mall, subdivided them into little six foot, 306 foot by 10 foot stalls, like in Mexican Mercado. So that suddenly, um, He's actually getting way more rent from 400 small merchants than from just the two junior department stores. Uh, and it's providing that entrepreneurial place for us, a new immigrant, to be able to start a small business and invest in a little, little. So each of these still, these are just the walkways. I mean, those, that's still subdivided into a whole lot more little, little spaces. Um, and it's become a true community center. So there's also a Sp Spanish-speaking lawyers' offices, Spanish-speaking pharmacies, Spanish cinemas, um, and, and political rallies, all sorts of, uh, it's really, you know, not just retail anymore. These ethnic malls, are, that conversions are happening all over the U.S. Um, and, and I think really gener generally very exciting um, places. So, the, what, but Buford Highway, where Plaza Fiesta is located, is kind of in the path of growth and a lot of redevelopment. And so there's a lot of concern now that all, all those little strip malls and all the, the little garden apartment complexes in between them are starting to be redeveloped. So now there's a new group called We Love Buhai. Um, that are really working on trying to build the social capital. I mean, the immigrant community tends to not have much political clout. Um, so there's now a lot more attention to how do we really celebrate the diversity of the, of the different cultures? How do we actually you know, love Buhai, even though really it's, it's a highway, it, it's recently gotten some sidewalks for some of it. Um, so now, one of the strategies, which I think is brilliant, is to say, you know, every one of those strip malls has a walkway in front of it. It's not much, but it's, you know, let's connect up all the walkways in front of the strip malls. It would be a lot more interesting to walk by the shops than to walk along the highway, between the highway and the parking lot. Let's encourage the owners of those shops and restaurants to put up lanterns that reflect their culture. Uh, and let's paint and chalk and stripe and you know, have fun with the sidewalks themselves. And they've already started a fantastic mural program uh, throughout it. And it's, it's the one place where I find myself defending the strip malls. I don't want to see the strip malls torn down um, here because it is, it is such a community. Uh, um, they, they, become, they have become a really strong kind of uh, community focus. Uh, so, and that also then brings me to the, the topic of, of social capital. Um, and again, there's just so many, oh, there's really so many really great projects um, to talk about here. So, a lot of it is sort of civic engagement, including local folks, you know, into participating um, in, in how do they be revitalize places. So, um, Build a better, has every, everyone heard of tactical urbanism? Yeah, I'm sort of assuming most, most, almost everyone. Build a better block is a, is a, real, is a they're part of the, um, I think, of the, uh, this, but tactical urbanism. This was started by three underemployed, a, a planner, an architect, and a musician, um, sitting around during the recession, like, we got nothing to do. 
uh, and they were mad that in their da suburb of Dallas, that this block was totally boarded up. So for 500, they had a budget of $500 total, and they say never spend more than that. Just keep it cheap, simple. Um, they got a permit for a two-day art installation. And in, for two days, they striped bike lanes, they brought in plastic street lights, they opened up the shops with just using milk plastic milk crates as shelving, lots of bands and food trucks. You know, and just kind of showing the neighborhood, like, this is possible, come on, we can do this. And they had a big party at, at the end, block party, and then um, you know, sort of had the city council there, and they're asking the crowd, hey, everybody, do you want this to be like this all the time? And of course, everybody's like, yeah. And he said, all right, Mr. Mayor, you only need to do two things. One, get rid of the minimum parking requirement for any business less than uh, 2,500 square feet. Two, get rid of your fee for cafe seating. Whoops. Um, eh, I'm gone. All right. Um, for cafe seating, we want to encourage people to be sitting outside. The city did that. I visited it about a year later, totally occupied, all doing really, really well. Um, that, these, that was in a more urban, uh, that was a sort of more urban block. Now, one of the same uh, folks who's been kind of involved with that group is trying it out. You can barely see, but that's a big strip mall with a big parking lot in front. Um, and he has pitch day to encourage small local entrepreneurs to pitch their business ideas to, uh, so they're doing a business incubator, you know, in a strip mall. Um, and that's been, been going along. And so now this neighborhood, Oak Cliff, you know, suddenly is being talked about as one of Dallas's hippest neighborhoods. And a lot of this is the work of a group called the Incremental Development Alliance. These are small developers who advocate what they call gentrification instead of gentrification. And it's simply a strategy of re-inhabit the existing buildings and maybe eh, if you build a little bit, it's just an addition. But it's going in and just doing very small scale. So here the hippest bar in Dallas now is just this, you know, it was an old, simple old building, but just re-inhabiting that very local, um, very authentic sense of place. Um, and a pretty uh, uh, fun group of small developers who kind of get together and trying to just educate ordinary people. That's how we built most of our small towns. They weren't built by development companies. It was just ordinary people who built one building after another after another. Um, now, you know, restoring and revitalizing our existing vacant stuff is so important. This is a suburb outside of Cincinnati that had a dead main street. You know, it had been an older town. It just had been swallowed up by sprawl. All the businesses had gone to the mall, and they'd been lying there dead. You know, little two-story main street, three blocks. Until a, gr a volunteer group of neighbors found, found out that if they, they got the area designated as a community entertainment district. Because, again, when the suburbs were built, the assumption was social life centered on the school. Everybody has families. And we don't want any alcohol anywhere near any of the schools. So most of the suburbs were legally not allowed to have nightlife. Now that most of the households don't have kids in them, you've got all these people desperate for some social places to be a little bit more social. Um, by designating it as an entertainment district, the cost of a liquor license went from 25,000 to 2,500. They then targeted all the veteran food truck operators and said, are you getting tired of driving around? Would you like a real brick and mortar location? And it worked. So now there's the coffee cart and the coffee shop, the cheese shop. You know. um, and so, so suddenly now a whole lot of other little towns in, in Ohio are uh, doing the same thing. Micro retail is another little infill um, kind of strategy to just bring some social space into otherwise residential neighborhoods. 
Nashville, e East Nashville in particular, has, a, has several of these projects where on a single family house lot, you're suddenly infilling these little 400 square foot, little, little mini shops. Um, in this one, they lead into the middle of the block. It's Nashville, music scene. So there's an open air pavilion for musical performances and community gatherings and, you know, super popular. Um, but in the middle of otherwise, a really pretty residential um, area. What's way more typical is just the conversion of, you know, re-inhabitation of dead retail space into these more community serving uses. So here a dead Walmart that's been turned into a public library. And there's just loads of these examples. Um, then here's a, just a strip mall. I mean, strip malls were designed to be the convenience retail. Uh, and yet now that more and more families don't have kids, they're eating out more, there's more and more restaurants, looking for places, the only places they can op find to open a restaurant are in strip malls, and yet nobody wants to look at the parking lot. You know, it's not very, it's not a romantic date night, um, you know, <laughs> out at the strip mall. So they cut two holes into one leg of the strip mall, put up an open air wooden uh, sort of ceiling, but that makes that now the cozy cafe, great linger space, um, it also means that the back of the strip mall became a new front. So it's the truck docks, the trucks still come in and do their loading once a day, but the rest of the time now, the neighborhood can actually walk and bike um, into the strip mall. Modest little, little shifts, but that uh, make a big, big difference. Uh, we're seeing art coming into strip malls. This one is a wild place. Um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, there's an artist collective that took over a strip mall, and now it's the highest grossing tourist destination in Santa Fe, and Santa Fe is a big <laughs> kind of tourist town. It's an immersive art. Every room is, you know, just kind of a surreal dream. Um, I love in this one, through the, you, you have to walk through the refrigerator door to then get into the next room and stuff, but super popular. They're now franchising. They're actually, um, they, they're gonna take, they're, they're open for bids for strip malls in other, part, other cities um, to do a bunch more Meow Wolf uh, installations. Um, and then, you know, on the social capital side, there's just, again, so many opportunities. One of the most popular, um, uses that has been going into a lot of these former retail spaces are education. Everything from um, early, you know, er early nursery schools up to college. So this is in, um, Aust in East Austin, which was really kind of the, the poor side of town. The mall died. Um, and a commu the Austin Community College initially just took over this piece, this former department store, J.C. Penney, and made it into, their, into an enormous math classroom. Uh, they're doing such a good job. This is essential for teaching those middle scale, middle wage jobs, math, getting math instruction to work, which is, has worked. That has now attracted a bunch of digital employers to rent some more of the space, and that as part of their lease, they have to hire interns from the community college. And now the community college has, they've bought the whole property, they've partnered with a developer who is building housing on top of the parking lots. So you're getting, actually, I need to update my sign, I need to get the, the first one has been built. So you're getting re-inhabitation and redevelopment and a little bit of re-greening and it's all right at a new uh, light rail station. So the re-inhabitation with community serving uses, you know, just boom, 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 it can, al it can also trigger um, some pretty great things. Uh, what we also see in terms of social uh, capital, again, is that, that desire of people to really get together, creating public spaces. So in the US, we built a lot of suburban style shopping malls in, even in our downtowns. Uh, so this one in Ohio, in Columbus, it died early on in the recession, so they demolished it and simply made a park. With the hope, then they, they leased, it has a, 
underground parking. So they leased the rights to the revenue from the underground parking to a group that was put in charge of programming the concerts, the, the farmers markets, the events, you know, and making the park so desirable that that would attract urban housing to ring around it. And that's exactly what's happened. So the, again, the value of a well-designed park, um, even you know, in this case, so it's, it's a suburban form project going into uh, re-greening. Um, this is another re-greening project that, again, with tremendous social capital impacts. This is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's just a small, not even three acre, just under three acre truck dock loading facility. Um, in a, what had a former industrial area, there were a few artists in some of the industrial buildings. A local foundation started buying up a lot of the, uh, the um, older buildings, bringing more artists and arts programming to them, and then wanted a gathering space, um, really, for the community and to feature arts. So there's a big lawn, they build a stage. Um, in order to be able to really power now, you know, the, you've, once you, if you're going to make it a, not just a garden, but an actual programmed park, you've got to have bathrooms, you've got to have power. So they put in 120 geothermal wells to capture, get, get sustainable um, heat and cooling for a nonprofit that then programs the park. So you're getting that sort of energy sustainability, helping with the social sustainability. This park has been so successful at helping to revitalize this whole arts district. There are now five others in the suburbs around Tulsa, all kind of looking at this. There's increasingly, I think, the recognition, I mean, that back in, in the 19th century, our cities were industrial. And so the Olmstead Park is the picturesque, beautiful respite from the city. That was what we needed, what we wanted with parks. Today, we, it, we, when you, especially in more, in more suburban contexts, when people have lawns and trees uh, and picturesque parks around them, what they're really looking for is programmed social activities. So this space is just programmed night and day, constantly filled um, with activities. This is another uh, um, programmed park that does some other interesting things. Um, this was a, the site of, on one hand, it was originally a drive-in movie theater. It then became a cinemaplex. Somebody was murdered. Nobody went to the cinemaplex. The cinemaplex died. Um, it is now a movie theater anchored mixed-use development. So here's the movie theater. Here's the town green. This is big, re mostly retail and restaurants, and then a lot of residential um, coming in around it. And What's pretty cool is actually they did one simple thing. They put all this, the ground floor is all the small walkable stuff, and then they put the big stuff up above it. So great walkable urban fabric, restaurants, boutiques, retail um, along the bottom, two stories of par a parking, and then a Target, sort of the big box suburban retail at the top. Um, and so here's, here's what that looks like. It, same thing with the cinemaplex, apartments, uh, restaurants down below, and then the big theaters, the big stuff all up above. But what they also did was put a movie screen, a L big LED screen, on the park. So it's 6 in the morning, they can do yoga classes. At 9, 11 in the morning, they do stuff for toddlers and moms. At lunch, they've got different kinds of programming. In the evening, it becomes much more oriented to the young, to happy hour, cocktail hour. You know, I mean, they're just constantly programming for different groups. Uh, so the way, I think, um, there's a lot of interesting stuff with the, uh, how we're changing, how we think about, about the regreening and the activities. And one of the groups that, in particular, uh, the suburbs are retrofitting for are the elderly. So how do we integrate? The old model of senior housing was always put them, you know, secluded, off in a box, surrounded by berms and trees. Now, this is the site of a dead mall that had been built on top of a wetland, right next to the town's little main street and right next to a big lake. Um, it's been draining, 
toxins into the lake for decades. Now it's mixed use with senior housing, very much as a, integrated as a part, as a continuation of the main street. And extreme, I think we're, we're starting to see a lot more, um, a lot more of that interest now in, uh, of sort of more urban senior housing, even in the suburbs, and a lot more attention to now how to, so the whole thing is built on a wet, former wetland, so the whole thing is actually built four feet above grade, under the streets are cisterns, they're capturing all the storm water, so no, none of it runs into the lake anymore. Um, again, doing some pretty good things. We're also seeing stormwater parks. This is another dead mall built in a little town in Connecticut, but it was built on top of a major creek. It's been flooding like mad. So they finally demolished the mall and just made it into a park. It's a stormwater park. It's designed kind of like a bathtub. It can hold all the water for the entire downtown uh, and then slowly release it. So you're, you're, we're starting to see again these regreening, but it's also um, helping to solve in this, the, the sort of problems of climate change and adding resilience. Um, I'm going to skip this one um, very quickly. Just mention now for office jobs, I mean, not everyone can be an entrepreneur and be a small local business. The office jobs, uh, you know, but everyone wants to be creative. And increasingly now, what we're seeing as we're seeing a lot of these office parks starting to fail is that they're recognizing they need to start <coughs> urbanizing and introducing urbanism as the new amenity into the office park. So uh, this, is an off this is an office park. I mean, it looks like housing. It looks residential. But this is, in fact, all office condos. And it advertises itself as offering courtyards, not cubicles. Now, this is right next to the Los Angeles airport, so they can do, they've got great weather. They can, um, they can actually do a lot of that work outside. But I think it's, it, it's, it's part of um, really reinventing kind of what the workplace uh, looks like. Again, in California, this was a project that was built some time ago. This used to be a big strip mall in San Jose, the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, and they built a street and it very successful, very high end, very expensive um, housing and shops that then attracted more residential than a whole lot of office. Now across the street, three million more square feet of office, um, the whole thing being rezoned for more uh, urban village. So you're just sort of seeing how urbanism, that ability for people to get out of their office and walk outside and breathe fresh air and get lunch um, re is beca has become incredibly important uh, to a lot of folks. And yet we have so much of this. <laughs> you know, this is what in the 1970s, this was Crystal City outside of Washington, DC. That's just, it does look that grim most of the time. Um, it's, they're planning a lot of infill and a lot, bringing a lot more residential, but the first step has been to just improve the streetscape. So they built little skinny liner buildings, in this case, right in front of the office buildings uh, to create side, you know, sidewalk life and street life. Um, this one is a little office park, just three buildings next to a mall and some low rise garden apartments until a new transit line was extended out of DC uh, and so when that happened, the, off, the owner of the office park said, oh, my surface parking lots don't make sense. I'm going to insert a new main street in between my existing office buildings and then put in more housing, grocery stores, cinemaplex. Since then, the mall has considered extending across. Um, the, several of the apartment buildings have been replaced with much higher density. So as an urbanist, I kind of love this project. They didn't tear anything down, they just added stuff. As transit came in, they added the street grids, getting more connected. As an architect, when I went and saw this, I wanted to scream. They hired a strip mall architect to design their main street. Completely, you know, this is designed with big colors, simple fonts, big bold, as if so that you could read it going 50 miles an hour. If when, you know, this is exactly when you where you need to reward the pedestrian eye. And I showed kind of the other slide 
um, not too far from here, of where it's been done, that done much better. Again, design matters. You know, this is the office park where most of my students from Georgia Tech would like to work at, if they're going to have to work in an office park. Um, this is a former taxi distribution center outside of Denver. It's where the taxis would park at night and get worked on with auto body repair and stuff. So they've completely adaptively reused the old auto body repair and then added a, lot of, uh, a bunch of new mixed use buildings. They're recycling all the materials. I mean, even the quote unquote park, you kind of can still see the parking lot striping underneath. It, it's all kind of really playing to the authenticity. We're not trying to erase the past. We are celebrating this non-corporate, totally non-cubicle Dilbert world. We, we want uh, to be a much, much more um, you know, creative kind of uh, office, creative place. And this, this, this has triggered 27 redevelopments just along that corridor. So that brings me to the last challenge, and I know I'm really pushing the time here, but just three or four more slides here, on autonomous vehicles. So as we look ahead, none of us really know. We're not, even the technologists don't really know, but none of us in this room know exactly whether autonomous vehicles, or will they solve all the technological glitches or not? We don't know exactly what's <coughs> going to happen. Our job is to help communities envision the future they desire and then figure out how do we leverage autonomous vehicles to achieve that vision. So the real question is not, oh, are autonomous vehicles coming? It's how do we want AVs to retrofit our downtowns and our suburbs. And I would argue that 99%, that, you know, there's so much attention going into the design of the vehicles, there's remarkably little planning going into their impact on our cities. And to the degree that there's any planning, it's their impact on highways and downtowns. And it's as if, again, the suburbs don't exist. <laughs> um, and it's really where most people live. And so most people who talk about autonomous vehicles, and I, I include myself, I did, I was, I did a, a studio on this topic two years ago. I'll do another one this coming, next year. But most, a lot of people talk about it. Autonomous vehicles are going to probably give us certainly some aspects of heaven and some aspects of hell. It might be a lot more of one or the other, depending what policies we set in place. So heaven would mean, hey, we might have way quieter, safer, much more people-oriented streets. Um, we probably, you know, heaven could easily mean vast reductions in privately owned vehicles and cheaper mobility for all. Everybody can get around with robo-taxis and, uh, and um, autonomous shuttle buses much less environmental impact, and much more affordable urban living. If, you, if your transportation costs really go down, and suddenly you free up all those parking lots as potential building sites all over the place, then it, that suddenly you've got a, a ton of new cheap land. Well, we should be able to get some really affordable, uh, more urban living. Hell, on the other hand, probably means we end up with technology-dominated streets. Certainly what I'm seeing so far. Um, Atlanta right now is we're the, uh, investing in a one and a half mile smart corridor that will connect Georgia Tech, where I teach, to Pond City Market, a really great redevelopment. Um, and it's all about, so how many sensors and what do we, how do we, what do we, how do we plan for the cost of switching from 4G to 5G networks and how and where, it's all being, the, the discussion is completely being dominated by uh, the cost of the infrastructure and the type of technology that will optimize the, th the throughput and behavior of the vehicles. Um, I think hell will also, and most people point this out as well, exacerbate the segregation of the rich who will be able, who will want to have that the private luxury of your privately owned autonomous vehicle where everyone can have a driver <laughs> and everyone has the luxury of, the t of, of being very 
private. Um, and that, will, that world will completely separate, cut itself off from the poor who can't afford to improve the infrastructure. Because this stuff, the vehicles may well in, end up not being all that expensive, but the roads and the streets and the networks that they will rely on will. Um, there's also a lot of concern about doubled congestion because of zero passenger miles. Somebody will say, you know, OK, car, take me to X. I don't want to pay for parking. Go back home. Come pick me up <laughs> when I'm ready. Go back home. You know, the doubling of congestion with zero passenger miles or uh, anyway. So we could easily just end up with it makes suburban sprawl more affordable because suddenly people can get out to that further land and all that stuff. So which way are we going to see it go? Who knows? Um, we know autonomous cars, robo-taxi fleets, trucks, shuttle buses, flying taxis, all of these things are more real than you may think. Um, uh, you guys probably know about the AV shuttle buses already operating in uh, between Kista and, uh, is it pronounced Kista? Shista? Kista. Kista. Um, and, and stock, Shista, okay, thanks. And Stockholm, I, I knew I wouldn't pronounce it correctly, but um, so you guys have them, obviously, right here, and KTH is working with them. Uh, you may not know about the quadcopters, which um, the idea is, there's a very serious, these are also being proposed as flying taxis, um, systems of them in London, that you, on the roof of a parking garage, you, would let, you can get into one and it flies you to another roof of another parking garage uh, as, a, as a new form of moving around. These are all very, very real. They're already happening. Um, so they, and again, the potential in downtowns, they have great potential. So in the downtowns, lots of, I think, pretty obvious potential benefits of just making it easier to live without a car. I have dedicated lanes for autonomous shuttle buses, less machine learning on the dedicated lanes, and we already have the window of time. We know right now that the autonomous shuttle buses are already happening and because if they're on a dedicated route, they don't have to learn as much. We're not, it will be a few more years before we're gonna have the mass privately owned shuttle buses, I mean, privately owned cars. So the real question is, can we get people liking shared rides in the autonomous shuttle buses? Now what's the real benefit of the shuttle bus as a transit system is that 50 to 85% of the operating cost of a bus is the labor of the driver. Now, nobody wants to see all these drivers lose their jobs. But at the same time, what that means is instead of one driver with a big bus that comes once an hour, you can suddenly have six shuttle buses that, for, that are six to ten, small, much smaller that come every 10 minutes. And that's a game changer for transit. Um, and it doesn't, you don't need the guideways, you don't need, you know, you've, so the opportunities in terms of transit are pretty great. The opportunities to rebuild all the, on the parking lots, on the, the parking garages, all of that is pretty great. But what about the suburbs? What do we want the impact of AVs to be on the suburbs? Uh, at MIT, the Center for Advanced Urbanism held a big conference in 2016, and promoting that conference, um, Alan Berger showed this image on the left you know, of really solar suburbs and autonomous vehicles and drones would allow us to have a much greener life. You know, forget the fixing the broken suburbs, we'll just go further out and make much greener new suburbs. Um, on the other hand, we have the kind of image of, I, I certainly always, th I'm reminded of the image uh, from WALL-E, the movie, where the by and large corporation owns and controls everything. And so the world of automation is one where humans are just sort of pacified by living in hovercrafts with food constantly available to them through the one corporation. And what worries me is whether this is actually the face. So if, if the kind of green sprawl image is the space, is, is 
an image of what more affluent people looking for the luxury of, of green um, high tech might be after. I worry that Wall E is the image of low tax base suburbs that aren't going to be able to afford the infrastructure and yet may very well be approached by the big corporations who say, we know you can't afford to, buy, to pay for your infrastructure. Sell us your streets and we will provide all of those networks in and maintain them uh, for our vehicles in exchange for exclusive rights. You can only travel in our vehicles on those streets. And I am very worried about um, the possibilities of that future. So um, in between, the optimistic side of me still hopes that it, we might, in fact, uh, start to see what, it's wonky sounding, but um, might be called shared mobility suburbia where there are incentives for shared rides on the autonomous rapid transit shuttle buses and the robo taxis combined with tolling of zero passenger or solo passenger trips. With autonomous vehicles, we will know that every inch that every car travels, we could begin taxing use, usage of streets. And that's probably the only way um, that we would be able to really incentivize or disincentivize different modes of AV travel. We also, I think, though, could do a much better job through design of just enhancing the experience of sharing. How do we design better bus stops that make it, you know, if people are already sitting there, even today, with Uber and Lyft, you're on your phone calling it up. What if it also asked you, told you, huh, three feet from you is someone who is a friend of a friend of yours and is going in the same direction. Do you want to share a ride? You know, you are so many social media steps away from such and such. Or could you set up games and things that, uh, you know, or this sh shuttle bus is really, you know, specifically um, going to be a, a discussion of the book of the month club or you know we just what are all the different kinds of ways to really reinvent the social experience um, of sharing and mobility so those are really um, you know I'm closing with this slide which I love this painting by a um, Swedish painter um, where really just sort of asking, turning it around to you guys, how do Sweden's suburban communities want to adapt their aging buildings and infrastructure to the challenges of automation, climate change, and, and an older, more single, more foreign population? And do you want to do, you know, will some of those communities uh, want to be redeveloped and want to really see they're in prime locations, they have great transit, and they really are, they, they really should be redeveloped and have that opportunity. While others, it might be more important um, to really pursue strategies of localization through re-inhabitation with small businesses and community serving uses. Are there other locations? where there's ecological repair is needed, reconstruct the wetlands, uh, really re rethink the flooding issues, um, and or where social capital and kind of program parks are what are needed through regreening. So I flip that around to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Ellen, it was so dense. So packed, and again, it's my fault. I said, Ellen, you have all the time in the world. I know, I and if you give that, that to Ellen, it's gonna be all the time in the world. <laughs> so blame me, but it was, it was worth the blame. So uh, uh, we won't have too much time because yeah, a lot of people are leaving now, but if you have anything that you would like to ask uh, Ellen now, now it's the time to do it. A provocative, a provocative question. Mm -hmm. What about the houses? Because uh, I mean, my, I, un I understand that the malls, are kind of a second generation of suburbanization pattern. Mm -hmm. But the first way was the, as the first uh, 
uh, the first, how say, the first stage was really just the houses mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere and just driving to the city. So you did not mention what happens to this pattern of houses that kind of dominate American cities. Because there really very little is happening to individual houses. There's so, because of the, the nature, it's the nature of the ownership. Once you've got, we actually refer to and do a lot of the um, study in our book looks at the work that Brenda Shear has done, establishing the differences between what she calls the static tissue of morph in, a, in or urban morphology of you know when it's when land is subdivided into a lot of different little private parcels and different owners, it's pretty static. It is very rare. There are. Um, about seven examples where an entire neighborhood has uh, been bought up by a developer just knocking on individual doors, offering them double the tax assessed value when they've sold out. Um, but it's, it's rare. I mean, there's just not, you know, so that's pretty static tissue. The malls, the strip malls, that's very elastic. And th those properties, well, not the malls so much, but the, the strip malls along the corridors, you sort of see little new outbuildings, new little you know, stuff. That's fairly elastic and you see a lot of change. But it's sort of the malls, the office parks, those tend to be si large, single owner, and they're referred to often more as campus tissue, where they'll be relatively stable until when they flip, it's cataclysmic. And it's, it's catalytic, it's a really big change. But there's just, there are some pretty interesting examples of the, um, in, Min in Minnesota, they, uh, in Maplewood, Minnesota, they've taken residential streets and narrowed them, building in sidewalks and rain gardens. So because they, Minnesota is the land of lakes and they've had a lot of problems with eutrophication in the lakes. So by narrowing the street, they're reducing the amount of runoff. By putting in the rain gardens, they're capturing and infiltrating more of the rain. So they've reduced the amount of um, toxins going into the water 80% by doing that. But it's pretty, again, pretty rare. It's a great example. It's expensive. So they haven't done very much of it. I wish there was more of that. Uh, can I have another comment in the similar direction? Sure. Because I come from uh, South uh, Europe, uh, Macedonia, mm -hmm. and we do completely the opposite. We give power to the people who live in, uh, who own lots. Mm -hmm. And they kind of develop more urban structure over several uh, generation and, and it consignian uh, terminology is called burger cycles. Mm -hmm. Brenda Shear, it's a great. She is also in the club of consignians. So, so you can if, if you kind of uh, uh, work with the plot equally to you walk at a street on urban design level, because if you because it, this is all about uh, the street mm -hmm. so far. Urban designers, I mean at least American urban designers, learn about the street and how to fix the street, but did not really focus so much on the lot and the potential of the lot. Is it, is it and I, I wonder what, why is the reason? Well, Americans mm -hmm. have so much culture of being privately driven uh, innovation and then their suburbs are the... Because and I, I totally get where you're coming from and there are a few exceptions where some of what you're describing um, does happen. But in general, the same Americans who love the suburbs because it's all about all oh, that you know let's the private the rights private ownership of the land and the rights of the private homeowner will also say yeah but I have a right to look at your, the, the property across the street from me and expect it not to change from what it was when I bought it and that's where zoning comes in and so the same it the zoning is the tool that then everyone in the community has to agree on. And it's, that's where, that is where, where, especially in single family home, residential neighborhoods, it, it's only if the ownership changes, that the zoning won't allow the kind of incremental change that you're talking about. Uh -huh. We have one more. Right. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Um, looking at uh, the retrofitting of the suburban centers, you see that they're really trying to create this atmosphere and uh, image of a very urban sort of downtown Some area. Of them, you also yeah. see that very much in, in the features that they're uh, proposing. So you said that the face of 
the suburbia is, is changing. Mm -hmm. Is it just a face or is it also just the inside or is it maybe disappearing or shifting into something else? Because we haven't really talked about the sort of the uh, definition of suburbs and, and herbs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how, how, do you, how do you see that development? So as I said at the beginning, you know, I'm, I am mostly looking at all of these case studies relative to the, the form. And so it's not always the location. Sometimes it's urban, it's uh, urban location, but it's suburban form in terms of the before condition on the property. But the changing faces of suburbia are actually really, really important. Uh, the changing demographics have a lot to do with this, the aging of the population, much more ethnic diversity um, in the suburbs now, way more um, than there used to be, and a lot more E way more jobs out in the suburbs than there used to be, and yet very little, we're sort of still stuck in this image of the 50s suburbs are what people expect them to be, that's why they moved there, they don't want to see change, you know, until they start to see dead businesses. And so we have a, a phrase, NIMBYs, which means not in my backyard, so which is very common whenever a zoning change is proposed, people will say, oh yeah, we'd love to see that, but not in my backyard, not over here. <laughs> you, know? you can do change only away from me, and if everyone's saying that, nothing changes. Uh, what we, until suddenly if the mall goes dead, then suddenly you've got all the neighbors saying, okay, what do you got? Come on, <laughs> do something. Um, so, we're just, the suburbs are really, as I said, they're not as suburban as they used to be, but that's still the image. And so they're going through some, they're, that's why I find them really quite interesting. But they're, again, I don't want to be too uh, oversimplifying as if all suburbs are only one thing. They, they vary, there's a lot of variety. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, thank you for a great talk. It, um, I'm from the United States and it's very, a very hopeful uh, conversation that you're offering. I, I guess I, I have two-ish questions. You, didn't, you touched very briefly on um, online shopping, mm -hmm. but, but your conversation is kind of dominated by um, inc you know, diversifying and uh, creating new opportunities for retail space, maybe a little different. So mm -hmm. maybe you could just touch on, on where you think the opportunities are in a new consumer market in the United yeah. States. And, um, and maybe a different question, maybe you touched on a little in your final, uh, final slides. Um, if a private developer pays for the uh, street and the street development and the street kind of space, does that make it a private space or a public space? So I'll, I'll go first on the online shopping. Um, yeah, retail in the US, we are so <laughs> over retail. Basically, we have approximately twice as much retail square footage per capita as any other country. So a lot of retail experts say, uh, this, we're just finally correct, this is a correction. We've been competing. The retailers have known that they're building way too much, but the only way to get, compete and get more sales per square feet has been to build more square feet, <laughs> even though, you know, so it's been a losing game and it's fine. So uh, finally catching up. What is happening, though, is to compete again. Online shopping right now is still at only about 11, 12 percent of all sales. So 88 percent of sales are still retail sales are still happening in brick and mortar locations. But online is obviously growing and it's got the retailers worried. So retail, the re retailers now, for the most part, to compete against online, they can't compete on price or on quantity. What they can compete with is experience. Give you an experience you aren't getting online. So what we're seeing, uh, so the, the, you know, the experience of shopping along a main street as opposed to online is, a pre is there's that chance of social interaction. You're seeing other people. If it, it's kind of delightful and stimulating, you know, that's one thing. If it's the, the malls that are doing the best right now in the US, provide the experience of luxury, marble floors and la la la. <laughs> so um, again, you know, the, the, that's, kind of, so yes, we are seeing, um, I think quite still new retail, but it's tending to be smaller. 
uh, and it's tending uh, to be very highly experiential. And a lot of food, lots of emphasis. Um, restaurant receipts exceeded retail receipts in shopping centers for the first time uh, a year and a half ago. So then the second question, um, remind me again, was the... the yeah, so it's, um, it's surprisingly murky what exactly constitutes public space and private space, especially because in, in redevelopment, almost all of these projects involve a public-private partnership. Often it's the public sector that is build, the, the private sector may in fact be building the infrastructure, the streets, but the public sector is ultimately paying for it and ultimately owning it. But there's a lot of often time lag in between, sort of in how in those, those things occur. Traditionally, when a private developer would build a subdivision, they would build all these privately owned streets and then they'd give them to the city because they didn't want to be responsible for plowing them and uh, maintaining them. And the city saw it as, oh, free, great, we've got a street. They saw it as an asset on their accounting rather than as that long-term maintenance liability. And they're starting to recognize now that that maybe wasn't such a good deal. Uh, but no, if it's privately a lot, there are a lot of retrofits that have privately built streets that are continue to be privately owned because the developer feels they can maintain them to a higher standard than they trust the city to. And so there are examples that you can't tell walking on it or driving on it that whether you're in public or private space. Um, but most of the time, it is public, but not always, and you can't always tell. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's... Okay, thank you, So Naomi. I do uh, think the suburbanization of poverty is going to I'm not going to even try to wrap this up or summarize it. That would be impossible. But this just shows what kind of richness we have in this series in general. What our colleagues and friends um, bring from different parts of the world. Do. Because there's a lot of general lessons that can be learned. And I was just making some mental yeah. notes. I don't even know where to, where to sort of start or end. This yeah, I know, whole thing but about by leaving the problems poverty, behind, I mean, just, just, know, oh, we'll just leave the problems, the problems over in the there inner and city we'll go areas start with the public housing programs, so which accumulated all kinds of things from violence, poverty, uh, drug use, and so on. And now it's moving to the suburbs. And if you think that you are, are you almost 70% suburban? For staying. Thank you for staying. I know, this was too long. This is just going to get worse and worse. Or is it the big, it's maybe the biggest challenge ever. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and when you're showing this, I was thinking of Alan Berger's, uh, what is it called, hill bop or the, the things in it. Yeah. So it's also the MIT's view of that technology is going to save everything. Yeah, that yeah. the well, future is, yeah. The problems. Yeah. Leaving the problems, just, right. Just, oh, we'll just leave the problems over there. Exactly. We'll yeah. So a lot of excellent open questions for us to, to ponder over. So thank you very much, Ellen, and we're glad that you've been part of the Athena series, and we'll, I'm sure we're going to see you soon. And thank you all for, this has been the longest one. The, but then again, each, each Athena lecture is different. So it's always a surprise. Thank you so much. Thank you.